Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Cryptography Research uh, Division of Rambus with Paul Kotcher, who is going to show us today about the Enigma machine, the uh, Nazi cryptography machine, which everybody's heard about, but probably most people have never seen in real, in real life. Was that the first cryptography machine that was ever done, or was it the best, or what, what made it so special? You know, it's neither the first nor the best. Um, there have been cryptographic machines and cipher systems dating back long before, uh, actually even the year 0 BC, there are some very, very old systems. What's notable about the Enigma, though, is it's probably the historically most important machine. Its cryptanalysis shortened World War II by a significant period, saved a huge number of lives. So, in terms of the actual historical impact, there is no machine that is more important. Um, but in terms of the history of cryptography, it's basically one point um, starting back with ancient systems that involved um, modified hieroglyphics and just simple substitution ciphers all the way up to modern systems today. And in this video I'm going to talk a little bit about the Enigma machine, how it works, some of its mathematical problems, and then connect those with the challenges that we have today in computer security. Here we have one of the few surviving World War II Enigma machines. And it's an entirely mechanical machine. There are no transistors, no tubes, but there is um, electricity and switches and light bulbs. And that's really all that's needed to make it operate. So let's open it up here and let me show you the different pieces inside. So everything here is original with the exception of the battery. Uh, batteries from World War II um, era wouldn't be working anymore. So there's some different combination, different parts here. There is a keyboard on top where each of these keys um, powers a, uh, or drives a switch. There's a plug board here in front where there are cables that can be connected um, essentially from one letter to another in a combination that can be changed. And then most important of all are these rotors on top. And I'll take one of these rotors out here to show you how it works. If I take two rotors together, you'll notice that there are these 26 pins here. As this rotor turns, the connection on this side changes which pin gets electricity over here. So if I power up one pin here, another contact gets powered, that changes which connection here gets powered, which changes which connection gets here, here gets powered, and so forth. So when you have the three rotors together, when one pin is powered, the electricity goes through from that to the other side of the rotor, through this rotor. There's then a reflector, which is a, a um, simple device with, with 26 contacts and 13 wires connecting them. So that means that the electricity that comes in one pin will come out the other set of three rotors, at a contact, the reflector will then power a different pin, um, and the electricity comes back around, goes through the plug board into the lamp. So the whole process here is a key gets pressed, electricity from the battery then goes to the corresponding wire corresponding to that key. That electricity flows and activates one of the connections on the plug board, which activates one of the pins coming into the set of rotors, which activates a pin on the rotor, the next rotor, the next rotor, the reflector, then it goes back through the three rotors, back through the plug board, and lights up a light. So when you want to send a message, whether you're encrypting or decrypting, it's the same process for both. You push a key on the keyboard, and a corresponding light turns on, and this rotor advances. Now every 26 advances of this rotor, the second rotor advances. So you can see here I gotten a second rotor to advance, and every time I push a key, the light lights up. So if I were here encrypting F, it would go to G. The next time I do it, I've got a dirty contact there, so it didn't light it up. F is going to Y. Uh, and so the process for encrypting, you push the key of the message you want to send, and look at which light lights up to get your, your ciphertext. Okay. One of the flaws of the Enigma machine is that um, if a letter encrypts to another, the decryption process is the same. So if I look, for example, here, F right now encrypts to O. If I back up the settings, O here encrypts to F. And a letter can never encrypt to itself. So how do you break this? Well, so in terms of breaking it, there's one thing that you're not going to do. So if we think about the different number of combinations that are possible here, first of all, there were five different rotors, and at any time you'd be using three of them. So there's five times four times three different combinations for that. The rotors have a setting on them that controls when each rotor makes the next rotor turn. So every 26 rotations of the right-hand rotor 
this rotor advances one position. Every 26 rotations of this rotor, this one advances one position. So there's 26 times 26 combinations there. There are a huge number of combinations for the plug board, and also there's this specific location that we're setting for the rotors. So in terms of the number of combinations that we've got, they're a pro um, if we calculate that out, so if we run through the different com number of settings, you've got your rotor selection, the positions of the rotors, the ring settings, and the plug boards. Um, the Germans generally use 10 cables out of 13 possible. So if you multiply the number of combinations of the cryptographers at Bletchley Park faced, they had approximately uh, 107,000 billion billion combinations of settings for the machine. So there's no way that you're going to go through all of those. But there were some very serious flaws with the machine and its design that made it so they didn't have to go through all the different combinations. So in particular, one of the properties of the machine is that a letter will never encrypt to itself. So you remember how I described when electricity was being applied to a letter position, it would work through the process and come out a different letter. So that means if you, for example, have a guess as to what a message might be. Um, for example, if you know that the message is describing a particular lighthouse being bombed, you can you have a guess about how the person sending the message would, would articulate that, then you have a guess, or a crib is what they called it at Bletchley Park, a piece of plain text that you can actually check against the, the received message, and if there are no places where a relatively long message matches up with the encrypted messages, you can guess with pretty good likelihood that that is a, the, the correct plain text for that message. So there was a process that the British would do, for example, literally bombing a lighthouse where they wanted to have a message um, sent, capturing the corresponding message, and then getting some known plain text. Once you've got some known plain text, the challenge is to figure out the daily settings and the settings for the machine. What happens in a modern cipher machine versus one of the older ones? Well, so a modern cryptographic algorithm has a couple of very different properties. So with a modern algorithm like AES, if you change one bit of the key, you really completely change how the plain text message is transformed into the ciphertext. But with this machine, the challenge that the designers had was the limited ability to do computation. So today we have much, much more powerful computing devices. Then just getting enough computation was very, very difficult because everything had to be done using mechanical parts. So if you're the cryptanalyst and you're slightly off, say, you had one plug board wire different, or the setting for one of these ring positions wasn't right, you'd still get something that was a close approximation, if not the correct message still coming out, because the likelihood of that change affecting the message isn't that great. Very different from a modern cipher. So to some extent, it was really human error and the repetition that was inserted into that, right? There was a combination of human error and limitations in the machine, um, as well as ingenuity initially with Polish cryptographers followed by um, some work with the French and ultimately the British and Americans. Um, really a team effort between different countries here. The, but this number of combinations is still larger than you could do easily with modern computers. So if you think of a modern computer able to do on the order of a billion calculations per second, well that chops off nine decimal places. But the observation of the crew at Bletchley Park and their predecessors, the Poles, um, and the French who were doing work with the Enigma was that there were shortcuts that they could use that didn't require going through this huge number of combinations. Are we still using the spinning wheels type of uh, approach? I know now it's electronic as opposed to mechanical, but is it still the same basis? Um, there are very, very rough similarities between the approach used but in modern systems, but the similarities don't go very far. Um, today, a lot of the modern symmetric systems, which is a cipher for which the encrypting key and the decrypting key are the same, tend to use um, lookup tables where you'll have kind of as the one of the building blocks, for example, a table with 256 entries and um, so a byte can come in and a byte comes out in a permuted form. Um, that looks a little bit like a rotor in some ways, but that's about where the similarities end. And in a modern system, the number of steps that we can do and the complexity of the algorithm is much, much greater than could be re realistically achieved using a mechanical machine. Where would this be used today? I mean, it's not something that we're going to use in our home networks, right? Well, if you're using an Enigma machine today for anything, you're, it's purely for historical reasons. Um, obviously, modern ciphers are everywhere, but the, the lessons that we can take from the Enigma aren't necessarily how to design an algorithm, 
but more to look at the questions of um, human error, of overconfidence. You know, in many ways, the greatest mistake that the Germans made wasn't actually they used a weak cipher machine. The U.S. at the same time was using weak ciphers as well with our M2 and 9B and other machines that we had. But we understood the weaknesses, whereas the Germans were overconfident in their designs. And that overconfidence led them to um, not question when perhaps they should or to place, place trust in things that they shouldn't. And if we look at our own digital lives, we have a lot of weak components that we trust even though we shouldn't. And the consequences of that misplaced trust are what you read about in the news every day as systems get broken. And like the Enigma, an attacker's job is to break the system in general without being detected. And it's a major failure for the adversary if their cryptanalysis or if their attack is discovered. So the British went through a great amount of effort to conceal their successes breaking the Enigma. Today, likewise, the most dangerous adversaries we have are exploiting our systems and not telling us. So it's the things that look like they're working well for which we don't really know what's going wrong, yet the attackers are getting everything that they want. They're the greatest danger that we have. How safe are we and how safe will we be in the future from um, hacking and breaches and everything else? Well, so we have three trends that have been really going on since the 1940s. We have devices in greater number, so there are more targets for an attacker to go after. We have devices of much greater complexity, so the sort of surface area per device that an attacker can target is going up. And the value of information, the information on our devices is going up. So the benefit to the attacker of breaking them is increasing. So we have less strength per device. We have um, more ways, that, and more ways you can attack the devices, more devices, and greater reasons to attack them. So all of these trends are going to drive continuously worse security and greater breaches, at least for the next four or five years. There are technological solutions and approaches that eventually may be able to check some of these, these trends, but if I look at where we are today and the, sort of where the research is, where the commercialization is, you know, this year's attacks are going to be worse than last year's, next year is going to be worse than this year, and the trends are overall, at a macro level, um, quite alarming. And we're going to continue seeing this play out just as we've been seeing it play out. You know, a couple of years ago, it was news um, and surprising when there was a big, big breach. A few years before that, people were saying, well, we're going to have these breaches coming someday, but they hadn't happened yet. So it's going to keep getting worse. If you take your laptop today, you've got gigabytes of software on that. And in many cases, a bug in any of that software compromises your security. So the problem that we have today is we have too much computing power, and we don't know where it is and what it does. So in the problem that the, uh, existed in the 1940s of the scarcity of computation, both for the folks building the cipher machines as well as for the people trying to break them, has really flipped around so that now our problem is an excess of computing power. We don't know where they're computing devices. And we don't know what they're doing. What is that processor in your TV doing? What is the processor in your light bulb doing? What is the processor in your phone doing? Nobody understands the software in your PC. There's so much code there. There's no person that understands it all. There's not even a single person that understands how the microprocessor in your PC works. Yet the gaps between what the different pieces are doing, how those all fit together as a whole, are ultimately um, what lead to security problems. So what, are you, what else are you seeing in terms of common mistakes that people are making? Well, so in the Enigma era, human errors by German operators were actually instrumental in many ways in breaking it. So, for example, there was one operator who frequently used his girlfriend's initials for the daily key instead of picking a random combination of letters. There were other operators who would use the same um, initial settings of rotors without changing them very much. There was another case where there was an operator who was instructed to send a dummy message, but sent a long message consisting entirely of L's. And when that message was recorded by the British, they recognized quickly that this long encrypted message contained no L's in the encrypted message, so therefore it was highly likely that the plain text was all L's. And that message was very useful in helping um, with the cryptanalysis effort. So Paul Kotcher, thanks very much for a great explanation. And really, thanks for showing us a, a really interesting machine. You're welcome, Ed. Thanks for having me.